Malala was born in 1997 in Pakistan. These were difficult and dangerous times because there was a war between the government of Pakistan and the Taliban. The Taliban wanted to forcefully impose their ideas. One of these ideas was Like you, Malala thinks that everyone has the right to go to school. So at a very young age, she began to defend her right and that of all the girls in her country to go to school. Do you know how old she was when she gave her first public speech? At 11 years of age, Malala became a blogger for the BBC. In her blog, she explained what the war was like, her fears, and how she lived under the threat of the Taliban. To write her blog, Malala The war continued and the Taliban prohibited girls from going to school. They also destroyed hundreds of schools to prevent them from even trying. They threatened everyone that wanted to go to school. They began to see Malala as an enemy because she defended the right of all girls to go to school and dared to make speeches against the Taliban. As the result of the threats she received, Malala Something terrible happened. When Malala returned from school, the Taliban shot her and she was seriously injured. Luckily, the doctors managed to save her life. After a few days, she was transferred to a hospital in After many operations and days in the hospital, Malala made a complete recovery. On July 12, 2013, the day she turned 16 years old, she made an emotional speech before the UN. Since then, July 12th is Malala Day. But Malala's international recognition does not end here. At just 17 years old, she became the youngest person to receive the Malala's struggle for the right of all girls to go to school has barely begun. Malala continues working and spreading her ideas through books, documentaries, and interviews. Because today, there are still 130 million girls who cannot go to school. Marie Curie was born in Poland in 1867. She was one of the greatest scientists of all time. Although she was an excellent student, Marie was not allowed to go to university because she was a woman. So Marie, She later had to move to Paris to continue studying. In Paris, she became the first female professor at the University of Sorbonne. How incredible! Marie was a great scientist. She discovered two new elements, polonium, which she named in honor of her country, and radium. She discovered that radium emitted a greenish light, which she called radiation. She invented that word. As well as being a great scientist, Marie was also an extraordinary woman. 
During the First World War, she realized that wounded soldiers should be operated on as soon as possible. So she created special ambulances with machines to take mobile x-rays. People called these ambulances Little Curies. Thanks to her research and discoveries, Marie won the most important scientific prize in the world twice, the Nobel Prize. She was the first woman to win this award, the first person to win it twice, and the first person to win it in two different categories, chemistry and physics. To this day, 100 years later, only one other person has managed to match this achievement. Marie's husband was also an incredible scientist, and she shared the first Nobel Prize with him. Their daughter Irene won a Nobel Prize in chemistry, and their second daughter's husband also won a Nobel Peace Prize. Radiation is very dangerous to human health. This is well known now, but it was not known in Marie's time. Marie frequently got sick from working so much with radioactive elements without any protection. She died when she was 66 years old. Amelia lived a quiet life until one day she got on a small plane and decided she wanted to be a pilot. That doesn't seem so strange nowadays, however 100 years ago planes were very primitive and there were very few female aviators. Flying was for men. Amelia did not want to waste any time so she learned to fly and bought her first plane. It was yellow and she called it the Canary. Then she set her first record. She was the first woman to fly at an altitude of 14,000 feet. After that, she broke other records and became even more famous. Then one day, she went on a truly extraordinary trip, for which she would be remembered forever. Exactly! Amelia was the first woman to fly across the Atlantic Ocean. She did it alone, piloting a Lockheed Vega 5B model airplane. She left the United States and wanted to get to Paris, but in the end she landed in Northern Ireland. Amelia was not only a great pilot and adventurer, she also wrote books, founded airlines, and helped to make airplane flights popular. She was a strong advocate for women's rights and fought for universal suffrage so that women could vote in their country's elections. She worked in the university to help other women who wanted to become pilots and engineers. She was one of the founders and first president of the 99s, an international organization of female pilots. The organization aimed to support female pilots as well as helping women who wanted to become pilots. Hooray for female pilots! In 
In 1937, Amelia attempted what would be her last challenge, flying around the world in her plane. She left Oakland and crossed the United States until reaching Florida. From there, she went to Brazil and then crossed the Atlantic Ocean to Africa. She flew across Africa to India, arriving in Australia. Unfortunately, she disappeared when she was trying to reach Howland Island on July 2, 1937. Her whereabouts have not been known since. Thanks to her tenacity, courage, and drive, Amelia Earhart was and is a source of inspiration for many girls. She's helped break down stereotypes and make more women interested in aeronautics and engineering. Frida did not have an easy childhood. When she was a child, she had an illness that left her with one leg thinner than the other. Then when she was 18, she suffered a terrible bus accident. She had more than 32 operations and spent many months in bed. She started to paint because she was bored. She painted with a special easel so she could paint lying down. painter. Most of her paintings are self-portraits, which means she painted herself because she said it was what she knew best. Since Frida had many health problems but had a zest for life at the same time, her style of painting is a very strong mixture of joy and sadness, of dreams and realities, of color and pain, her paintings are very personal and reflect what she felt at the time. Frida was not ashamed and did not hide anything. In a world where women were required to be beautiful and feminine, she painted herself by exaggerating her eyebrows and mustache. She shows everyone how she felt through her paintings. She was proud to be as she was, a Mexican woman wearing traditional and colorful clothes. Frida fell in love with the most famous painter in Mexico, Diego Rivera. They got married and had a difficult relationship. Everyone in Mexico called them the elephant and the dove because he was very big and Frida was very small. Frida got sicker and sicker towards the end of her life, but still wanted to live life to the fullest. Her last painting is called Still Life with Watermelons, on which she wrote the words, Viva la Vida, Live Life. Her unique style has made her one of the most important artists of all time. Jane Goodall is the world's leading chimpanzee expert. She was born in England in 1934, but has spent many years living among chimpanzees in Tanzania, Africa. She's become world famous and is a great activist for the protection of all animals. Her story begins when she was very small. Instead of giving her a normal teddy bear, her parents gave her a chimpanzee. She called it Jubilee.
Jane has spent half her life in Africa living among chimpanzees. As you can imagine, it's not easy. At first, she was not allowed to go alone. So on her first expedition, she took... Before Jane, scientists studied animals from afar and did not relate to them. They thought that animals had no personality or emotions, and so they believed that there was no need to give them a name, but a number. But Jane was a different scientist, and she came to the world to change things. Instead of studying the chimpanzees from afar, she started living among them. She gave them names like Fifi and David Greybeard. Jane was criticized for doing things differently. However, thanks to her innovative ways of studying chimpanzees, she discovered that each chimpanzee has its own personality and that they're capable of feeling and expressing emotions. They can get angry, be affectionate, joke, and kiss. That was unheard of until then. Jane was so involved with the chimpanzees that she's become the only person to be accepted into a group of chimpanzees. It took her a long time to achieve. She says that's normal because the chimpanzees had never seen a white chimpanzee before. But Jane Goodall's story doesn't end here. In addition to being the most knowledgeable person in the world about chimpanzees, she made another incredible discovery. Chimpanzees are able to use tools, something that was thought only people could do until then. Chimpanzees are capable, for example, of using sticks to fish out ants from inside anthills. Jane is not just an expert scientist in chimpanzees, she's also a lover and protector of all animals in general, and a strong defender of their rights. This is why she's become a great activist, and has created numerous animal advocacy foundations such as the Jane Goodall Institute. My mission is to create a world where we can live in harmony with nature. As of today, 60 women have traveled to space, and each of them has experienced their own adventure. From the first to make a trip to space more than 50 years ago, to those who have spent months living on the International Space Station, their role has been essential in space exploration, despite the fact that they are a minority. This is their story. You don't need to just put on a spacesuit and climb into a rocket to go to space. It takes a lot of smart people to perform very difficult calculations. Women like Katherine Johnson, Dorothy Vaughn, and Mary Jackson, a group of African-American mathematicians who worked at NASA during the 50s and 60s. Katherine, for example, calculated the trajectory of the first American who went to space and the trajectory of the first flight to the moon. No woman has ever gone to the moon, but if it were not for a woman, no one would have ever gone. This woman is Margaret Hamilton, an engineer and computer programmer. Margaret was in charge of designing and programming the landing system of the Apollo 11 mission, which brought the first men to the moon. During the ship's arrival to the moon, errors occurred that would have crashed any computer, but not one designed by Margaret. Margaret programmed the computer so well that it focused on the important task, don't crash the ship, ignoring all the other errors. It was a huge success.
While women in the United States struggled to get a place at NASA, in the Soviet Union, Russia nowadays, a group of women were training to go to space. The woman chosen was Valentina Tershkova, who went to space in 1963 alone aboard the Vostok 6 ship. Before traveling, Valentina worked in a textile factory, but she was an expert parachutist. A few years later, Svetlana Savitskaya was the second woman to go to space, the first woman to make two trips to space, and the first woman to do a space walk, the first to leave the ship while she was in space. Meanwhile, in America, Sally Ride was the third woman to go to space and the first American. She spent more than 14 days in space, during which time she helped put two communication satellites into orbit. She also performed pharmaceutical experiments. She later became the director of the California Space Institute. Mae Jameson was a doctor who worked for many years in Africa, but she always wanted to go to space. One year, she submitted an application to join NASA, and she was selected. In space, she experimented with weightlessness and dizziness because she was a doctor. Peggy Whitson is an amazing astronaut. She's been in space for more than 665 days. This is longer than any NASA astronaut. She is also the woman who has done the most spacewalks. She's been a commander of the ISS twice and has been a manager of NASA astronauts. She's done so many incredible things that there isn't enough room to fit them all. In 2012, China sent its first female astronaut to space, airplane pilot Liu Yang. This veteran pilot had been training for two years to go to space and has done so with excellent results. More and more women are achieving leading roles in the space race. Wangari was born in a small town in Kenya. She was a very good student as a child. She finished school with the best grades in class. This allowed her to enter the only institute for girls in the country, and when she was finished, she got a scholarship to go study in the United States. When Wangari returned to Kenya, she realized that the level of water was lowering in the rivers, the lakes were drying up, and the forests were diminishing. This was not only bad for the environment and animals, but also for the people, especially women, who had to walk further to collect firewood, food, and water. Wangari decided that something had to change. She realized that the problems were arising because they had cut down all of the trees. So to resolve it, she had to. But Wangari did not plan on doing it alone. She went from town to town to convince the women to plant new trees and protect the few that remained. She told them to search for seeds in the forest and then plant them in small cans. After the seeds were cared for and watered, they grew until it was time to transfer them.
and let them grow into big trees. This simple idea became the Greenbelt Movement, and since then, more than 40 million trees have been planted. That's a lot of trees. But Wangari did not stop there. She fought to turn her country into a democracy and get rid of its dictator. A few years later, she became the Minister of Environment and Natural Resources of Kenya. In 2004, Wangari received the Nobel Peace Prize for a lifetime of activism and major successes. She was the first African woman to receive this important award. Today, the Greenbelt Foundation that she founded continues to work for the environment and women's rights in Africa. Hi! Do you want to know why Rosa Parks was known as the mother of the freedom movement? Do you want to know why the world is a better place today thanks to her? Here is Rosa, waiting for the bus back home after a long day's work. It's December 1st, 1955 in Montgomery, United States. Seat for whites. Rosa can't sit here. At that time, unjust laws kept black and white people separate. The front seats on buses were reserved for whites. This is called segregation. Back seat. Rosa could sit further up. All the seats are taken. What do you think the driver did? There. The driver told Rosa that she had to stand up and sit further back. That's what the law said. What did Rosa do? arrived, who do you think they arrested? Exactly. The laws were unfair. Rosa was arrested and had to pay a fine. That's the end of the story? What happened then? I know what we can do. We will boycott the buses so no one uses them. I don't know, it's late and I'm tired. Should we leave it be and go to bed? The bus boycott lasted more than a year. The laws were finally changed thanks to the strength and the unity of many people. It was a great victory. However, there was still a lot of work to be done and many other unjust laws had to be changed. The more we gave in, the more we complied with that kind of treatment, the more oppressive it became. <laughs> 